Australia likes to stand out from the crowd. We've got funny people, strange food, but I think it's our bizarre natural wonders that take the cake. From the waterfall that falls sideways, to strange sightings in the sky, to the ground that swallows caravans, we're home to places and events just so strange it's hard to believe. By chatting to witnesses, experts and locals, I want to find out what on earth is going on with Australia's weirdest phenomenon. So let's do this. Whoa, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> Okay, weirdest animal in Australia. Ooh, that's easy. That's gotta be the platypus, for sure. <laughs> An echidna? <laughs> An echidna? Australia is known for its unique animals, but nothing gets weirder than these puppies. I'm talking about monotremes. So how do we end up with them? I've tracked down echidna expert Jane Fenelon. So I heard that when a British Museum employee first saw a platypus, he thought that was a prank. Oh, completely. He apparently actually spent a long time looking for the stitches. He really thought someone had taken like a mole or a weasel and just stitched on a, a duck beak to this animal. He couldn't believe that it was real. And then you can imagine when they found out they laid eggs as well, they didn't believe they laid eggs for a long, long time. That was just another level of weirdness. They just couldn't handle it. They'd never seen anything like it in their lives. Egg laying isn't wildly shocking, if you're a reptile or a bird, but monotremes are mammals. So why do they lay eggs? They're a bit of a mishmash of reptiles, mammals, and uh, just what we think the ancient original mammals looked like. We think the original mammals did lay eggs, so that's they've just happened to retain that. I always just had an image of the egg being like a chicken egg and something you can crack. The echidna wren and platypus eggs are completely round, and they're also more leathery, so it's just more like a reptile egg, and you actually, you can't crack them as such. You have to actually tear them to get them open. It's very bizarre. Baby echidnas weigh less than a gram, so they have some unique methods for getting themselves out. Animals that lay eggs need either an egg tooth to get out of the egg, which, you can, which they use to tear the egg, or they have a little bony process on top of their noses called a caruncle, and which they use to kind of like headbutt the egg to get out that way. The echidnas and platypus are the only species that have both of those. For some reason, they're just like, one of those is not enough to get out of this egg. We need to have both of them. And so we think that's what's happening is they're kind of like headbutting and then tearing with their teeth and just like tearing a hole in this egg and then coming out of it. Echidna hatching is crazy, but how they make their babies is just as odd. Echidnas have four penises. Okay, that'll, that's a showstopper. An echidna penis is quite elaborate as far as penises go. It has four heads. It's like Jurassic Park mixed with like Frankenstein. Like they just kind of mix together all the bits. So instead of having just one head at the end, they have four and they've been described as rosette glands, almost like little flowers. It sounds prettier than it is, but it's very bizarre when you see it. And close up, they do have like some little spines a little bit as well. It's about seven centimeters long too. So it's quite, for the size of the echidna, it's quite long. So I have to ask, why four heads? Particularly when males are competing for females, you do get this evolution of various reproductive structures trying to compete. And one of the ways they can compete is like trying to get these more and more elaborate penises. And so that's why they can alternate between the two sides because that means they can like mate with one female and then immediately turn around and mate with the other female by using the other side. It's one possibility. We tend to think of echidnas as land animals, but in another funny twist, they like to swim. They don't get forced to, but they'll just quite voluntarily go out on the beach, go out into the ocean, go around for a swim and come back in again. They seem to just do it for fun to a certain extent, as well as just to cool down. Like us, they just like going for a swim. As it turns out, there's an evolutionary reason for this seemingly bizarre behaviour. I think this was a little bit of a surprise that platypuses and echidnas have a common ancestor only perhaps 30 or 40 million years ago. And that's estimated from molecular dating. So taking long DNA sequences and working out how long ago those DNA sequences split. So they've only evolved to be what we now consider to be echidnas relatively recently. So what makes echidnas such good swimmers? They've got this quite dorsoventrally compressed body form, which is also typically a, a swimming adaptation. They use their humerus to rotate. It makes them basically front wheel drive. And that front wheel drive style locomotion also seems to have evolved from them having swimming ancestors. They use that little 
kind of beak is a snorkel and uh, it's a curious looking thing, but um, they're quite efficient at it. Definitely, they've got to take the gold medal for Australia's weirdest. They just seem to have so many weird characteristics. Every time you think you've found, you know something about them and like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You find something else weird. So you, I was like, oh, egg laying. And then I'm like, oh, weird penis. <laughs> stuck in that it's a fire tornado i mean what that's full on you can rely on australia to turn up the weather so weird that it gets its own nickname fire nado a scary vortex of flames spinning at 200 kilometers an hour i know it sounds like a bad film but i promise you these things are very real at the far right the funnel of the tornado comes into view this is rather frightening Oh, I get pitted with stuff. Stinging the daylights out. Shoots of tin floating. You near it in the camera. Power lines going down. The first ever one of these that was documented happened in Australia's capital in 2003. I found a local who experienced it firsthand. Hi, Christine. January 18, 2003. Can you talk me through that day? Okay. Well, it was hot. It was blindingly hot. And our daughter knocked on the door and said, have you guys got any idea what's going on outside? And we went, no. And we went outside and there was just these columns of smoke just pouring out. It was terrifying. And next thing, this noise. It was like a jet line was about to land on our roof. The house was just vibrating. Residents didn't know it, but the fire had morphed into a tornado. The woman at the end of the street told us this thing, whatever it was, had taken her roof off, the complete roof, lifted it up and deposited it on Mount Taylor. We saw it there for weeks after. Could anything have sort of prepared you for that particular day? Nothing. Absolutely, absolutely nothing. I think you have to live through a tornado to know what a tornado feels like, to know that it was just like being in the middle of hell. Everything is suspended. The laws of nature are suspended. Nothing could have prepared me for that. True fire tornadoes are rare. Most of the videos you'll see online are actually fire wells. The difference is in the way they're formed. Fire wells are spiraling flames. They whip up in a bushfire when wind catches from both directions. Fire wells tend to be smaller and usually you'll have a, a spinning column of flame um, quite visible. But a fire tornado is something more fierce. It's literally a tornado made of fire. For this, you need a fire big enough to create its own weather storm. A fire tornado is really a weather event inside a larger weather event than the, the firestorm. You're going to have bits of embers and uh, flames carried along. It's basically all, all the things that you get from a regular tornado, but throwing in fire and embers as well. Only a unique set of conditions will trigger a fire tornado. You've got the winds creating rotation within the air and the air mass. Um, once you get a, a, a thunderstorm forming over that, you get big updrafts, which then will sort of tilt that rotating air upwards. And if you get enough rotation throughout that whole column of air, then that's when you start to get a, a, a tornado. Wind and fire make a powerful duo. But let's take a closer look at the physics. Obviously, we can't build a thunderstorm in here. Instead, we're going to make a fire wall so we can see how the wind influences the vortex. Get the base of a tea light candle, add some rubbing alcohol. Goggles, gloves, light it up. Now let's see what happens when we put the cylinder on top. Nothing. <laughs> but if we offset the cylinder a little bit... Whoa! We have a fire wall. That's Pretty cool trick. That's spinning convection at play. To get the flame to spin, we need to introduce some form of rotation. So when I offset the cylinder, it forces the air to move in opposite directions. That starts the spinning rotation, and then the upwards heat causes the flame to go zoom. Firewells are a lot more common than their supersized tornado cousins. But could we be seeing more fire tornadoes in the future? I mean, it really comes down to how prone you are of getting these large firestorms developing. 
if you get one of those intense enough um, forming, then there's always going to be a likelihood that uh, a tornado could form. The 2019 Black Summer saw over 30 firestorms, a record number. So what we see when we look at um, climate change trends, so they, those dangerous conditions are occurring more often, particularly in southern Australia. Here, hot, dry landscapes and cold air fronts form a lethal combo. To make a thunderstorm, thunderstorms actually like a bit of moisture. That involves these, these cold fronts, which periodically come across the bottom of Australia. And when the front comes in, you've got that, that instability um, in the atmosphere, so firestorms will become more prevalent. So firestorms are on the rise. Does that possibly mean more fire natives? We haven't yet been able to understand how that might relate to a fire-generated tornado. I think that's going to be a few more years or more of research needed until we get to that point. It looks like uh, cordial, like just, yeah, some weird flavored cordial. At first, I thought these Instagram photos were Photoshop, but no, it turns out Australia has pink lakes. Water's clear, all blue, all green, sometimes brown. So why are they pink? And why does it happen so much in Australia? Australia is home to hundreds of ephemeral pink lakes. A permanent one is Lake Hillier in Western Australia. I'll admit, it looks fake. <laughs> it's certainly not fake, no. And it is that pink in person. I've been there, I've seen it. It is quite phenomenal to look at. It's like a pink milkshake. Did you drink it? Wouldn't recommend drinking it. In fact, Lake Hillier is 10 times saltier than the ocean seawater is. In 2015, Ken visited Lake Hillier to try and solve the pink mystery. A lot of people knew that there was a certain algae in these salt lakes called Denaliella. And so the theory was that that was going to be the cause of the pinkness. Denaliella salina thrives in super salty water. As the environment in the lake gets more and more extreme, this D. salina starts pumping out as much pigment into its cells to protect it from the UV. The pigment is called beta-carotene, which also gives red cabbage and carrots their colour. Eventually, up to 16% of the dry weight of that, of that cell can be filled full of um, beta-carotene, so the, the more it gets in there, the more red it is. So you tested Lake Hillier's water, but you discovered something unexpected? We confirmed that Denaliella salina, the algae, was there, but it was there in low amounts. And really, one thing stood out to us, and that was this bacteria called Salinobacter ruba. And that bacteria is this pinkish red colour. So is this bacteria why Lake Hillier's colour is so bright? That's more vibrant because the actual bacteria can contain more of the pigment. There's no other chloroplast to contain it. It's just these bacteria cells just fill themselves up. With the help of these critters, Lake Hillier has been pink for centuries but not every pink lake keeps its colour. This is the same lake as what I saw before. Get out of town. No. Well, it's not pink. It's no longer pink. Why? It lost its pinkness. Sure, Lake Hillier is popular now, but in the 80s, it was Pink Lake that got the people excited. You had the Pink Lake Drive-In, Pink Lake Road, Pink Lake Butchers, and all these commercial businesses and places named after Pink Lake, and, and the lake hasn't been pink since the late 1990s. Pink Lake lost its hue due to excessive salt harvesting. Tilo estimates it would take five to ten years of intervention to make it pink again. Tilo, how come you're in your car, man? Is everything all right? Esperance's internet is uh, is pretty interesting at the best of times. I've gone to the source, so that's why I'm in my, in my car parked under a, a um, 4G, 5G tower. While WA's lakes look like, I don't know, strawberry milk, this one in the heart of Melbourne looks like toxic runoff. Hi, Marty. So this lake, it can't seem to make up its mind. It's dark green on Google Earth, but it's been pink in the past. It's since 2012, it has been pink at times. Um, so the last time it went pink was April 2019. Um, we just haven't seen it return since with the cooler summers we have had. A spell of dry, hot weather will change the salt levels in the lake. It uh, is a natural phenomenon that happens when the, the temperatures are right, um, drying out the, um, evaporating the fresh water element out of the salt water. 
um, that then activates the, the algaes, which then give it the pink appearance. There's a dead giveaway when these aquatic changes occur. There is sort of a, a two-week period where uh, the, the nose of our ranges can um, tell us whether it's going to change or whether it's about to change. There is a lovely um, aroma in the air uh, that um, gives us that hint that, yeah, something's <laughs> changing in the water. It's, it's close to spoiled eggs. Oh, gross. <clears throat> Have you been tempted to swim in it yourself? No, I, I can't say I have been. It's a, a sight to be seen and uh, that's as far as I'm happy to go. How come Australia has so many salt lakes? The combination of our climate, hydrology, hydrogeology, Australia is a very old continent. And underneath those lakes sit saline water tables. And with that, that drying climate and that, that stable hydrology for millions of years, the evolution has just occurred so that these makes sense for these um, these little algae or bacteria to protect themselves from the harsh ultraviolet light. Honestly, there would be hundreds of pink salt lakes in West Australia alone. Whoa. Yeah, they, they do look like, ironically, the opposite of earthworms, cloud worms. This cloud? is one of the world's rarest weather events. They look like giant sky worms or jet exhaust, but they're completely natural. Johnny, how you going? Good, yourself? Yeah, I'm one of the handful that have been up there and got to fly this weather phenomena uh, called the morning glory cloud. It's a rare phenomena that happens uh, in Australia, uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Everyone I know that's flown it has had the same look on their face when they come back from flying it. So I was like, I need to experience that in my life. Surfing the morning glory is not for the faint hearted. Only a dozen gliders have ever attempted it. They describe it as a tsunami in the sky. So it's it's this big rolling wave cloud. In the front of this cloud is is all this lifting air. So you're able to to saw the front of this this cloud mass that stretches from horizon to horizon. Those who can't stay in front get sucked into the whitewash, the equivalent of a wipeout. The downwash on the other side of the cloud is, um, you know, can reach speeds of 2,000 feet per minute. And it's very, very terrible. And your glider's bouncing around. You can't see what's going on because you're in the cloud. Sometimes you come out, you don't know what, which way you're facing or anything like that. What does it feel like when you're up there? For me, it was feeling how small I was against this cloud. I felt like I was this little speck against a 2,000 foot ski jump. Yeah, it was certainly nothing I'm going to forget in my lifetime. These beauties are found in the Gulf of Carpentaria, in a place called Mungabai, Burktown land. In the local language, they're called Mabunta. Hi, Marindu. Have you ever flown the Morning Glory? No, no. I'm silly, but I'm not that silly. <laughs> yeah, they come from far off. Just a giant, long, perfect tubular cigar, totally unbroken, rolls over you within minutes. As it passes through you, and it literally does, like being at some rock concert in the base, hitting you when you're close to the speakers, it literally goes through your body. It's truly magical. In Gungalita Garawa culture, the cloud has a powerful presence. It comes along and resets things, picks up uh, recently deceased people's spirits and carries them along with it up to the Milky Way. It's a way for them to travel to where they got to go. Its arrival also signifies changes in the natural world. We know that when the systems are rolling in, the, the sea turtle are starting to nest and that heavy dew is going to come. So it's also a time for some burns, far more than, than uh, just a cultural supernatural thing. It's also a scientific indicator. So can you give us a tour of Mungabai? Let's have a look. It's a nice little community. It's April, today April. It's very flat country out here, as you can see in a second. They roll in from the north, out there, and they're heading behind me to the south. They also come from the east there. I reckon to the mid-70s, scientists have been coming here, so we started to understand that white science finds it um, as fascinating as us. I've managed to track down one of those scientists. It's basically uh, two flows of air coming in and colliding and causing uplift is the initial trigger to a morning glory occurring. The Gulf of Carpentaria is one of a few places where weather can conjure this phenomenon. It sets up these unique conditions whereby you can have two sea breezes coming from completely different directions, occurring and colliding somewhere in the middle, and that creates atmospheric waves. These waves of kinetic energy give the clouds their shape. At the crest, moist mm. air rises, then cools, converting moisture into cloud. 
on the descending side of that wave, water particles evaporate again. So that gives us the, the formation of that round cylindrical shaped cloud. On the right day, a morning glory can stretch for hundreds of kilometres. It's a pretty incredible phenomenon. How do you rate it? Oh, I think they're probably the most eerie and exciting in a way of, because they're so large, they're so huge, they're, but they're so close to the ground. They're breathtaking. They're beautiful. The locals used to say if, if there's a lot of condensation on the beer fridge in the pub, there's a good chance of having the morning glory the next day. Good old Birktown pub. Another one. David Attenborough said this is one of the most unusual natural wonders of the world. That's big, because he's seen a lot. Gravity usually pulls things towards the Earth, but not at this waterfall in West Australia. It's called Horizontal Falls, and the water pours sideways. What's going on there? Hi, Renee. So I can't quite wrap my head around this. A horizontal waterfall? Yeah, I have to say, when I first heard about it, I didn't really understand it. I had to, I think I had to look at a picture of it and I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Extreme tides and two narrow gorges create this natural wonder. I guess people think that the ocean is flat and so it couldn't have a waterfall. But in this case, the ocean isn't flat because we have a tide that's moving down so quickly and water's escaping a channel. At its peak, a million litres of water gush through every second, creating the waterfall effect. The water cannot exit the channel fast enough, so you end up with a very, very turbulent, fast flow. Kimberley tides are the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. They fluctuate by a depth of 12 metres. As the tide begins falling, water is trying to rush out through this very narrow channel but it's not able to rush out as fast as the tide is falling outside of the bay. Basically, this is the story of the Kimberley in general, is that water can't get out as fast as it's trying to. And so you have waterfalls and whirlpools and all kinds of features. So I have to admit, when I first heard about the horizontal falls, I wondered if maybe they defined gravity or something. No, it definitely obeys the laws of gravity, <laughs> like everything on the Earth. It definitely is obeying the laws of gravity. In fact, it's gravity that makes the tides do what they do. And for that, we rely on outer space. So the gravity of the sun and the moon is causing the water in the oceans to basically bulge out towards the sun and the moon because they have small gravitational pull. And it's enough to just pull the ocean out towards those celestial bodies. Unlike your normal waterfall that swells after heavy rain, these falls are strongest when solar and lunar calendars align. So spring tides happen uh, twice every month. So when the sun, the moon and the earth are all in one line, this happens at the full moon and the new moon, those gravitational bulges are all aligned. And so the tide is very big. It's like adding the sun and the moon um, bulges together, so we get a spring tide. When the tides are right, tourists come to experience the incredible force. Hi, Gabby. So, what does it feel like to cross them? It's like a roller coaster. It really is. It's like going through a washing machine. At peak tides, the torrent generates whirlpools deep enough to swallow a dinghy. So, the speed and the power of the water does make it, you know, a little bit dangerous, and, and why we do have to time it with the tide so that it is still going to be safe for us to go through. Say someone went overboard, they would get um, sucked down and spat out. I've heard of at least one fatality, a little recreational boat um, with people that just didn't understand how dangerous it can, can be to go through if you don't know what you're doing. I think everyone is a bit more aware now of, of how crazy driving through the falls really is. That's a big one. It looks like a, uh, just like a giant meteor just crashed into someone's yard. So here's the thing. Sinkholes are a phenomenon that freak me out. How can the ground be sturdy one second and then before you know it, it's sucking up buildings and cars and children? 
So what causes sinkholes? And can we predict them? There's a popular holiday spot in Queensland, Australia, where this has happened more than three times. The people didn't see it coming. You drive, mate. Jason and wife Mel nearly lost their caravan that night. Yeah, there was a lot going on that night, that's for sure. And then you could just keep hearing this funny thud, thud sound. So it was a really humming noise. It was sort of a whoom, whoom, whoom sort of noise. I didn't know what to think. It was the sound of sand collapsing into the ocean, just metres from the campsite. And it was, of course, hard to see at night because it was dark. Yeah, no one knew what would what it was or what was going on. They knew it was just coming in closer and faster and we just had to get out of there. But the amount it was dropping was crazy, how quick it was going. Partners and kids and wives and whatever running around and screaming and crying. It turned to a bit manic and people were just throwing things in like we didn't even have time to fold our beds up. We just threw tables and chairs on the, on the bed. Yeah, it was like a, a war zone down there. We just managed to get it out in time, so we had to basically tell or scream at people to get out of the way. Literally, if we waited any longer, I don't think we'd have our car and caravan. Mate, get out of that land cruiser! Jason and Mel were lucky. The campers next door lost their caravan and car. People with you know, generators and gazebos and some chairs and fire pits and so on all went missing. You know, they were just, yeah, couldn't get to them in time and uh, just gone down the hole. Yeah, it's memory that we'll never forget. <laughs> Headlines dubbed it a sinkhole, but what happened at Inskip Point was something else entirely. Now look, it's often thought of as being a sinkhole because it uh, looks a bit like a sinkhole, like it's disappearing, you know, before, before your eyes. In fact, it's just, a, it's a slope instability. There was one crucial thing missing, a hole. A uh, sinkhole is normally um, a near circular feature, and this is not, this is like an arc. It's a bit like taking a spoon, a large spoon, and taking a bit of a scoop out of the coastline. Sitting at the gateway to the largest sand island in the world, Inskip Point is part of an unstable sandy peninsula. So what we see at Inskip, these sub-vertical pillars of sand, they, it's just a precarious um, uh, equilibrium. Normally, we don't find sand piled that way in a natural condition. Too wet, too steep. Besides, every now and then to, to give way. When it does give way, it falls off in vertical chunks. And it's held up temporarily by what we call suction in the sand. And then all of a sudden that gets swamped, it gets saturated, and all of a sudden you lose it again. It forms another almost vertical slope. Like a sand castle, wet sand helps the shoreline stay upright. So it's just basically what permits kids to build sand castles. If you wet it a little bit, it gets almost, almost um, subvertical. But if you wet it too much, uh, it gets washes out by the water. You know, nature's a pretty powerful force. The ocean triggers this rare phenomenon. But what causes a true sinkhole? So sinkholes are different, but they're still related to water or water flow. Basically, they are cavities or pits in the ground that form when water erodes uh, or an underlying lock layer. And then the, the ground above that, uh, that uh, developing sinkhole gives way. It's rare, but there have been unexpected cases in Aussie backyards. We get them in urban developments. We get them in uh, sometimes and occasionally in the city. In the worst case, not so much in Australia, but in other parts of the world, we've, we've had sinkholes that are big enough to consume a house. Urban sinkholes are usually the product of humans meddling underground. If we think about what's happening nowadays, digging, uh, extraction, mining activities, increases the intensity and frequency of the collapse of sinkholes. So because of anthropic activities, we will expect this to happen more frequently. You could say, you know, what proportion of the Earth's surface has, has uh, actually experienced a sinkhole, and that proportion would be minute, you know, <laughs> so small you wouldn't even count it. I mean, it's certainly not worth people getting stressed about it, that, uh, oh, we might have a sinkhole beneath us, we might all disappear in a hole suddenly. Uh, I think that's going a bit too far. Having gone down this investigative wormhole, I've discovered Australia's weirder than I thought. It's kind of weird. We're home to unique creatures, weather events, and natural wonders. Look at that. That's amazing. They can be freaky at times. You drive, mate. But they can also be magical. They seem puzzling, 
Oh, wow. But there's usually an explanation in science. Thanks for watching. If you have any weird things, events, or places you'd like us to investigate, then please drop a comment down below and let us know. Also, consider subscribing to ABC Science. It's good stuff.